three, two, one. There we go. I have children. They are 17 and 14. And the best way to get them to do something is count to give them three seconds to get it done and then then do it yourself. That's right. Okay, uh, if you want to grab a last quick drink, sit down, we'll get started. Um, so this is the uh, afternoon keynote. Uh, my name is uh, Ian Gillett. Uh, I know it says Scott up here, but he's going to speak in a second. Um, I run a small market research consultancy called uh, IGR. Uh, we do we are industry research guys. So uh, when people con when people quote Gartner and IDC and that's my competitors. So, uh, but we do industry forecasts and surveys and all these good studies and things like this. Um, I'm actually uh, moderating a panel tomorrow morning on small cells. But uh, this afternoon, I get to introduce uh, uh, Scott. Uh, I need my, my cheat sheet. <laughs> um, so now we get the carrier perspective on indoor and DAS. And I, I'm not going to read um, Scott and Lorna's uh, bio, because they're in here, and you can read them. And they made me promise that I wouldn't do that. But what I will do is tell you what they do. Uh, Scott's going to be uh, speaking first. He's from uh, Verizon. And he's, uh, he's on the technical end of things, builds the specifications and such like for all the indoor RF. Um, and uh, Lorna is based in Minneapolis, north, right? Right. Cold bit. Yeah, but not this spring. No. No. Gorgeous. 70 degrees the other day or something, yes. Um, and what Lorna's group does is, uh, I've actually met a few of her folks, uh, they actually build the business case and the ROI and the... Uh, for the deployment of DAS and basically uh, for um, the advanced, what's it called, advanced? Antenna Solutions Group. Antenna Solutions Group, thank you. I get the A and the S always, yeah. yeah. Um, for AT&T. So, uh, so one, on one side you've got the technical view and on the other side you have the, uh, the business view, okay? Um, each of them is gonna speak for about 25 minutes or so and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, Tracy Ford, who you all know, said that she will pay $10 for every question. <laughs> and it'll be in the form of a check. You give her a business card and she will mail the check to you. Very yeah. Very soon, she said. Very soon. Um, so uh, we will be paying for questions. Um, so uh, if you don't have any questions, I'll have to come up with some. So please, questions. Uh, Obviously, the audience here, uh, th these are probably the people you, you really want to hear from anyway. So, with that, I will hand over to Scott, and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. So, I actually have uh, some notes myself. Um, my name is Scott Simone. I work at uh, Verizon Wireless in the maintenance engineering group. The maintenance engineering group, that sounds like, you know, we... Um, you know, we replace the toner and paper in the copy machines, and we do, you know, I do a lot of that myself, so. Um, but no, the maintenance engineering group, um, I, I just recently just moved from the macro network now into the, uh, the in-building space within Verizon. And, uh, you know, maintenance engineering group, it's, uh, we, we write the guidelines, we write the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, the pass-fail criteria for our antenna systems. Uh, the, the test procedures that our uh, field operations folks follow when they're out at the um, working out at the cells, uh, calibration procedures, things like that. So um, when they asked me to move over to in building, basically what they were asking was uh, they they wanted me to bring what we were doing in the uh, in the macro network now into the in building space, and uh, that's uh, that's where I've been for the last I guess six months or so. So um, one of the uh, one of the panel members earlier was talking about. Uh, passive intermod and um, the effects that it has on a, uh, on a system and even in a uh, low power in building system. So what I have is um, Zach's going to go ahead and kick off a, uh, a video and basically what you're looking at, I'm just putting my finger on a, uh, on a loose connector coming off of a, uh, an LTE Eno B and you can see no noise and there's the noise. That's, that's passive uh, intermod 
just due to a, uh, a faulty um, connector. This was up in uh, one of our labs up in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts. Which is good, because this is what I'm going to talk about. This is a part of the, uh, part of the industry. This is something that we, um, we saw a great deal of early on when we started to roll out LTE in our macro network. And um, I, di I didn't know if it was going to be much of a concern uh, for the in-building space due to the uh, low power type uh, remote radio units that are out there. But it turns out that it's, uh, it is a problem, at least uh, for us. I was supposed to do this. Doc, I thought you were doing this. There we go. Okay. So I think this slide here um, basically is, is covering what everyone was talking about a little earlier. I think at the, uh, at the end of the day on this slide, um, Verizon Wireless, I mean, I, it's, this in-building thing is a new transition for us. We don't want to become a, uh, a roadblock. I think, uh, I think Dan said that, uh, what was it, seven, seven out of ten in-building systems just, just don't happen because of the, uh, the cost structure. Um, you know, this is a, uh, this is a, this is a challenge. Um, we see a lot of systems, at least part of my job on top of um, the, the macro network and the in-building space was doing a lot of interference analysis. And there's a lot of times I could, I could stand up here for hours and talk about stories of um, um, interference cases where we've gone out and found um, improperly installed, uh, improperly uh, integrated in-building systems that have been jamming our network. Um, and they're hard to find. Uh, we've had a couple of systems that have, you know, been a problem for a few months. And, um, you know, when we approach the, uh, the building owner, I mean, they, they have really, they don't want us there. You know, they, they, I guess they kind of see us as a, as a problem. Um, it, it always seems like as soon as we sort of say we're here, we want to help, we want to fix this thing, and uh, by the way, you know, we're going to do all this for free, then they, they open up their, uh, their doors and start showing us all the equipment that they just said that they didn't have. Um, you know, so this is, this is the part that I want to try and fix. Um, when I think about our customers, I, I know who my customers are. I, I have internal customers, which is going to be the, uh, the regional folks, the, uh, the cell operations uh, personnel, and our uh, system performance and RF engineering folks uh, internally. And then, of course, there is the customer, the, the person with the uh, device at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the base station across the air interface there. Um, the customers that we're talking about here, I think, are going to be the building owners. And the building owner has their customers. They're looking at the people that they're trying to uh, fix a problem within their building, getting, uh, getting wireless services there. So um, for the building owners, and uh, even for the, uh, I guess, the, the integrators, um, definitely involving the, the wireless carriers is, is, is a positive. Um, we're, we're there to really help. I mean, if the system isn't designed properly, it, it's not going to work. It's not going to work for the customer. The, the building owner is not going to be satisfied. Um, you know, the carriers aren't going to be happy uh, being part of this. Um, so, you know, there's there's technical goals that we want to try and um, meet in order to meet the customer's uh, expectations. The transparency uh, bullet there. We're talking about operations. I think uh, again, that was another point that uh, some of the folks were talking about earlier was the uh, the alarming and monitoring. Uh, this is an area that, that I'm looking at uh, a lot, and that is if Verizon builds an in-building system and it's a neutral host, I want to provide a, uh, an alarm feed so that if, let's just say, for example, AT&T is uh, one of the uh, carriers that's part of that uh, neutral host, they can actually see the same alarms that we're seeing. They might just have a read-only uh, type access, but they can see it. If something does go into alarm, they could be put on a list that they would also receive uh, either a text message or email or both. Um, that's the transparency that we want to kind of put out there. Um, and and it's, it's, it's reciprocal, right? If we join a, a similar system, whoever the, uh, the person who's, man, who's maintaining that system, we want to have that same visibility. And you know, we don't want our customers calling us up and um, you know, telling us about a problem that we, that we don't even know about yet. Um, so I think there's a lot of value there. It's, it's definitely a, uh, you know, somewhat of a collaborative effort. The acceptance test procedures, this is, um, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into a, a little bit deeper dive, I think, from a, um, from a technical standpoint. But this is some of the stuff that we're looking at. We're trying to make these systems where we can go in and test them and evaluate them in, in a practical uh, manner. The build it and they will come, that, that philosophy, that's, uh, 
again, this, um, I, I run up on these things a lot, and they're typically interference uh, or, or, or you know, sources of interference that are jamming our network. We see, uh, we see a lot of these systems. Um, you know, when, when I was working in the macro network, it was always the, uh, you know, the guy with the pickup truck with 300 foot of rope who was calling themselves a, uh, you know, a tower contractor. Um, you know, now it's, uh, it's, now they've moved into the in-building space. So we, you know, there's, there's a level of, uh, yeah, there's something missing there in the industry. So we're, we've got to try and rectify that. Okay, so we're going to talk, uh, go a little, a uh, little bit more technical here. So, um, when we, when we look at a system from Verizon, if it's a, uh, if it's a neutral host, we we're, we're definitely want to optimize a system for, um, for a noise figure. Um, we want everyone's experience to be, uh, um, you know, to be a good experience on the system. If it's a Verizon-only system, we're, we're looking at the third-order intercept. Um, this is to protect us from the, um, you know, our competitors' mobiles coming in. They're being served by a, um, a macro network outside. Their mobile is powering up, and it's powering up right underneath one of our antennas. Um, you know, that starts to... Uh, we start to see a performance um, you know, problem there. We start hitting EGC. So there's different ways of how we're looking at this technically. And, and I guess you know, the message for you know, building owners and integrators, I mean, we understand DAS, these systems, they're very, very complex. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, it's just not a cell site with some cable and an antenna. There's a lot of active components and there's a lot of different um, you know, gain settings and, and different optimization efforts on this. Balancing the RF and um, you know the RF path, the uplink downlink. I mean, we're seeing this now very much with LTE. Um, it's it's critical that we uh, we get this right early on. The procedures that we're writing for our cell operations folks, it's based on you know calibrating or verifying the uh, the air interface. Uh, for Verizon, it's going to be CDMA, EVDO, and LTE. Receive band um, pin verification. This is sort of the heart of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and this is, this is an area where if, we, if we're looking at either qualifying a DAS or joining a DAS, we want to be able to go in there and, and do a very simple test to measure the, the quality of the DAS. How well was it put together? Did the, uh, did the contractor uh, use um, uh, components that were you know, meeting or exceeding our PIM specification? Did they tighten all the connectors? Uh, I think. Uh, I think that was, uh, that was Dan from uh, American Tower. He was talking about, uh, you know, access panels and making sure that we can get to these different uh, splitters and couplers and uh, uh, remote radio units because um, they're going to fail down the road or they can fail. You know, there's always going to be electricians up there working and cutting cable. So um, this, is, uh, this, this is the part of the, the maintenance. Um, but getting back to the, um, you know, the, the two-tone test, one of the tests that we've, um, we actually have put into practice at a couple of uh, neutral host systems is um, basically just putting in two test tones, one at the um, one within the AT&T frequency band and one in the, um, the the Verizon frequency band. And what we can do is we can calculate exactly where that third order uh, intermon is going to fall. It's you know, and of course this is um, you know we're doing this in uh, collaboration with uh, um, with with the the DAS owner, as well as uh, with AT&T. And it, it's pretty alarming what we actually find, but it, it's, it's an easy way to troubleshoot the, uh, the DAS as well. So just um, real quickly, just when we talk about PIM, it, again, it's a two-tone test. We look at uh, F1 and F2, and then uh, we can, you can see the calculation there. It's uh, two times F1 minus F2. It tells us exactly where the third order uh, intermod falls. Um, for LTE, what we look at in the, um, the upper C block, it's uh, if we want to stay within our band and use our own frequencies, we don't have the ability of looking at the third order. It now becomes the fifth order, and we have to understand how that changes. Um, even the power levels that we, uh, that we use is going to, to play a part of this. So what I'm showing here, for both, I don't know if you can see this, um, this, this bar right here, that's representing the, uh, the LTE uh, downlink, um, a 10 megahertz channel. This, uh, the shaded area, this is our, um, that's the upper C block receive band. And um, this, this wedding cake type shape, this is a um, sort of a convolution of the, using all the different subcarrier tones, we came up with, um, um, you know, different order intermod products and where they fall. Um, this was something I was doing a lot of work with, uh, with Enritsu, um, Jeff Heath actually. Um, playing around with this when we, we were talking about their, uh, their, their PIM analyzer that they were um, 
trying to come up with. But one of the things I, I, the, I really like about this uh, slide here is you can see that the seventh order and uh, ninth order intermod uh, falls within the um, within our receive band. And we'll, we'll get that get to that in a second here. But what's important to notice here, if we talk about F1 and F2, if I take the first part of uh, AT&T spectrum, let's just say 869, 870, somewhere around there, and I take our upper um, part of our B band, uh, which is going to be uh, like 891.5, um, when 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 these two signals are presented across a nonlinear junction, we're going to get this, this intermod. This third order intermod falls right within the, the cellular receive band. And this is, a, um, this is what gives us slow throughputs. This is exactly what we see when uh, we have customer complaints. So going back to um, that expanded uh, view of the seventh and ninth uh, order intermod products, um, that's exactly what I'm showing. And that upper left-hand shot of a, uh, from the spectrum analyzer, that's actually uh, some data that we collected during the, um, the early trials when we uh, started rolling out LTE. And um, at, at, tested at 20 watts on a macro network, I think the, um, the PIM signature was minus 125 dBC. Absolutely cripples the, uh, the cell from a, um, uh, from a throughput standpoint. And that's the seventh and ninth order, you know. So the orders typically, uh, the third order is going to present itself at a much higher amplitude. So when we talk about putting Verizon, AT&T, public safety, all these different carriers on these neutral host systems, we actually have the ability to generate third order intermods. Um, that's the worst case scenario, and that's really what I'm proposing for us to start testing uh, going forward when we start looking at um, qualifying in building type systems. I saw public safety was on the uh, on the list, so um, so this this stuff uh, this is where this this is actually the stuff that keeps me up at night. So uh, again, looking at uh, Verizon C block, you can see how close we are to the uh, the public safety block, and uh, I know there's talks of uh, public safety also rolling out in uh, in an LTE type fashion. Um, and if you look at um, again, if we start talking about neutral hosts, just uh, south of us, um, those are the channels that typically AT&T owns. So again, we have the ability, we're going to have that, that channel set there that's definitely going to allow us to uh, start seeing uh, third order intermods. So again, building these, um, these DAS systems and, and meeting the PIM specification, it's going to be critical. Uh, and that's why we're testing for the, uh, the worst case scenario. If we, can, if we can actually design a system that meets our third order um, PIM specification, once we actually bring all the carriers online, if there is a problem, it's, it's going to be below the noise. And that's the goal of uh, what we're trying to put together here from a, uh, um, from, a, from a DAS standpoint. OK, so um, here's just a real basic drawing showing an ENOB going into what we call a, um, you know, an RF conditioner. And all we're doing right now, the ENOBs are uh, fairly new. Um, we don't have the uh, flexibility of lowering the power. Uh, we can, but it's, it's, we're still playing around with it, looking at the reliability of that. But, um, what we're looking at, that ENOB, is actually a 40-watt system. So we've got to bring that 40-watt system down to something like 0 dBm or plus 15, whatever, whatever the DAS is willing to accept. So the way that we're doing that is we're actually going uh, just into a duplexer. We're taking that transmit path. We're dumping all that power into a, uh, um, a load, a PIM load. And then we're, uh, we're coupling that signal off for the downlink. And, uh, and then we're, we're feeding the DAS system in a, in a simplex fashion. Um, this, this, this jumper right here, where we come from the ENOB to the input of the, uh, the, the, uh, the RF conditioner, that's, that's really going to be the point where we're probably most likely to generate PIM. So it's critical that we get that part right. A um, couple of systems I've actually been, already been out to see and uh, view where we're having these problems. Uh, we saw, first of all, we had uh, an integrator put, go from a DIN to an N to an SMA type uh, connector. So there was stacked adapters. There was braided cable. The braided cable was kind of twisted up and all, you know, ran, ran over into a NARF conditioner. But it just, it turned out, it's, it's real simple. That's, that's the problem. Braided cable, that's like PIM 101 type stuff. Uh, stay away from it. Um, so that's, that's, that's really like the, the critical part when we talk about PIM. Uh, it gets worse though. Just recently I was down in a, uh, uh, Indianapolis, working with um, um, our regional folks as well as uh, with the AT&T folks, getting ready for the Super Bowl, 
and um, working with the integrator. And um, this is the other areas where PIM can be a problem. And, um, and you know, they were talking about the number of antennas and the cable. It gets pretty complex and it's pretty overwhelming when we start looking at it from this standpoint. We've actually found and troubleshot a couple of antennas um, and we tested the antenna at the power that the, uh, the RRU was designed to put out and that was only two watts. And um, we had the ability to take a PIM analyzer or a two-tone uh, analyzer and lower the power from 20 watts down to something like two uh, or 33 dBm. And I, I was pretty shocked seeing an antenna fail at like 87, I think it was minus 87 dBc. And, and that was, the, that was the, uh, the root of the noise rise that we were seeing in the DAS system once we turned it up. Um, that, that's the type of stuff that I'm trying to uh, steer us away from. I'm, we're spending a lot of time talking with our, uh, our base station antenna manufacturers. Um, we know that they could build us uh, antennas that meet the PIM specification. Uh, these are antennas that sit out large numbers of antennas. I'm, I'm hearing three to 600 antennas are being installed in some of these stadiums. Uh, so this is one of the first things I'm, I'm really focusing on at Verizon is coming up with an antenna that's approved that I know is going to meet the, uh, the PIM specification. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, when we were talking about doing this presentation in front of everybody, uh, a lot of folks in Verizon were saying, well, gosh, you know, why, why are you giving up the PIM secret? And, you know, they kind of see this as a competitive advantage, you know. We're talking about a neutral host system, and, and we're seeing lots more of it. You know, the, the base station is um, it, it's going away. You know, just I, I think uh, Jim said from AT&T that, uh, you know, we're, we're not covering the customers from the, from the outside in. It's inside out now. And, you know, most of these uh, building owners are going to push for uh, type of, you know, neutral host type systems. So it's important that we get it right and, you know, that everybody's sort of meeting the same specification. PIM really should be this test that's very similar to a return loss measurement that we have, you know, every day in our, um, in our macro network. When we talk about testing the, uh, the passive components and, and um, having a system that meets the, uh, the PIM specification, right now our, our, our pass-fail for PIM is minus 140 dBc, and that's tested at 20 watts. And, um, and, and what that means is I'm just testing the passive components, and that's with the antennas connected. Um, if you can hit that number, um, we're, we're certainly going to be in good shape all the way around, especially as most of these systems are low-power uh, type systems. Uh, I, I, get a lot of, I get a lot of feedback from the... Um, you know, from the contractors, why, why at 20 watts if it's only going to be a two watt system? Um, I mean, this this is an investment. You know, we don't know. I think we were talking about uh, trying to plan for you know five years, ten years down the road. Um, you know, two watts just may not be enough. We may see more and more of this as we add more and more services, whether it's public safety, AWS, PCS, cellular, 700. You know, these these amplifiers that are at the uh, far end, at the remote head, they have to uh, have. Um, you know, the capability of having more composite output power, especially if we're sharing it. One general rule of thumb that we use within Verizon is any of the components that we are specking out for our DAS system have a, a PIM specification of better than minus 153 dBc. Again, once we, uh, once we connect the antennas and get them in place, what we find is, uh, you know, you can have an antenna mounted and it could be very close to a cement wall that maybe has uh, rebarb inside the cement. Uh, that rebarb could be rusted, and that's a good external uh, PIM source. Uh, we've see, we see that a lot in a lot of the uh, vehicular uh, tunnels that we've been looking at. So antenna placement, having that relationship with the, uh, with the building owner, um, you know, that's, that's invaluable. Uh, having an integrator that understands this, you know, if they see something obvious, if they see, uh, you know, gosh, we were at a stadium, um, you know, a few months back, and they had put up uh, chicken wire to keep the uh, pigeons from flying up underneath the uh, stands. Well, the chicken wire was all wrapped around our antenna, and the chicken wire, of course, was rusty. So it's a very, it's an excellent PIM source is really what I'm trying to say here. Um, but if someone would just speak up and just bring it to our attention or bring it to the, the project manager's attention, you know, get it out of there. You know, let's, let's figure out how to uh, move that antenna or move the chicken wire or, or do something with the pigeons. I don't know. So again, um, protecting the, uh, the Verizon DAS investment. Um, so uh, we got planning, installation, qualification. So the planning phase, of course, you know, is, again, getting components out there that meet the PIM specification. If, if it doesn't meet it, hopefully it exceeds it. Um, the construction phase, again, speak up. You see something that just, you know, it's not going to work. You know, grab somebody, uh, you know, get them over there. We'll figure it out. Figure out how to move the antenna. 
um, talk to the building owner about different, um, you know, different antennas, how we can hide the antenna, stealth it, whatever, whatever it takes. But um, if the antenna is up against the PIM source and it's going to generate this noise, it's not going to work for Verizon. It's not going to work for any of the other uh, participants of the neutral host. Ultimately, you know, the, the building owner is not going to be happy. The, the people within the building aren't going to be happy. So, um, so it, it's definitely worth, um, you know, speaking up and, and clearing some of these issues out. And, the, and then uh, the last bullet is this uh, DAS qualification phase, the, the system acceptance. Again, that's talking about doing this, uh, this two-tone test that I was talking about earlier. Uh, take, it, take a PIM analyzer, lower the, uh, the power from 20 watts down to something that's closer to like two watts, if that's what the system is designed for. Um, drive the DAS, use a spectrum analyzer. Instead of looking at it from a, um, from a reference value of in, in DBC, uh, actually key up where the third order end mod is going to fall and look at it from its absolute value. And then, of course, you know, we've got the cord cutters and the high nodes, and these are really the new generation that never had to use wired devices, and they want to be able to um, use their wireless devices anywhere that they are. And this is all driving a huge demand in the network. <coughs> smart devices, the smarter the device, the more wireless data traffic um, is produced. Um, and this adds additional pressure to our network and additional pressure for us to be able to find innovative ways to provide additional spectrum and capacity. Cloud computing is projected to be um, significant or have a significant impact on the wireless network growth. And at some point in time, we see that the network will be in the cloud. You can see here that 50%, greater than 50% of enterprise email users, their primary access on, on browsers are um, tablets and mobile, mobile devices. And mobile development, um, mobile app development, is four to one over the native PC projects. So it used to be the other way around, PC development um, used to be very high and rapidly growing, and now we're seeing that shifting to mobile devices. Unified communications is also putting a lot of pressure on our network. Um, smartphone growth has driven the development of mobile application capability um, of seamless traversing between Wi Fi and cellular networks. Over the past 25 years, we have seen a decline in revenue, but an increase in usage. Um, the mobile network really has become the oxygen for business and personal communications. We must continue to um, meet the expansion demands. So the inbuilding road ahead, the good news is for those of you in the DAS business, because the demand is just so huge. Um, based on an ABI research report, inbuilding infrastructure is expected to more than double by 2016. So going from 20,000 to more than 50,000 installments, that, that is a huge increase over the next, over the next four years. So how do we remedy um, capacity challenges? We need to accelerate innovation in the network. So what we've done within the at t is we've developed an organization called the Antenna Solutions Group. This organization is solely focused on in-building solutions, expanding our network inside of buildings, and providing additional capacity to the network. The demand for mobility will continue to rise, and um, people, you know, people spend more than 80 percent of their time in buildings. And we're seeing that most um, voice and data sessions are originated in buildings. And you know, remember years ago when the network first started, we all focused on um, making sure that all of the roadways were covered and all of the outdoor was covered and those areas where people moved and drove and walked, and now we need to focus on areas where people gather, whether that's in building or out on campuses. So 
the ASG business objective is to um, extend the mobile network inside the locations where people gather. So into public public buildings. Um, we do this through neutral hosts, multi-carrier systems, as Scott talked about this morning, or earlier today. Um, we will share a network with the other carriers. Um, it's a very cost-effective model for us as compared to us putting in our own gas systems. And a lot of the um, building owners or venue owners do not want to have duplicate systems within a particular location. They want us to share the system. Um, this, is, this model is something that at and is, um, we've done very well in our attempts in our um, at and Towers Group. Um, they have worked with the other carriers for many years to bring them onto our towers on the macro network. So we do this very well inside of the in-building space. Our strategy is to uh, support our customers where they live, work, and where they play. Um, our charter is to provide them the best wireless experience um, is also to um, focus on high profile, profile events. Um, we work with third party mutual post um, DAS builds as well as, like I said, other carrier builds. We, we definitely are open to getting on those systems. And what this does is it helps our customers leverage our at and profile <coughs> or portfolio of services. <coughs> Some of the areas that we're focused in are, um, and we've got both a public and an enterprise group. So we've got the public group that is focused on stadiums, convention centers, casinos, retail, hospitals, airports, um, commercial high rises, and then we have the enterprise space that's focused on those enterprise um, locations that are um, you know, more public, uh, privately owned. Last year, last year, AT&T uh, deployed over 1,000 um, venue systems. Approximately 70% of those were enterprise and 30% were public. We see the, the rise in public space um, for um, 2012 to be significant over the enterprise space. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our strategies as it relates to the solutions that we have. So I know a number of you know what these are, but I'm just going to go through them quickly. But um, for the most part, all of our um, public um, deployments, we will um, have a head end. The head end system will be a macro BTS system, and to connect to um, varying DAS systems, whether that be an outdoor DAS or an indoor DAS. Um, for the most part, they are indoor. Um, we were heavily using um, repeaters and bi-directional amplifiers, but our charter really is to add capacity to the network. In, in doing so, um, the repeaters and the, the PDAs are really not sufficient for us to use to do that. Small cell, um, small cells. We do have some small cells that we are um, looking at and evaluating in the ATT labs. It is definitely a place that we want and need to get to, um, to provide uh, that capacity in the network at a lower cost. And then we also have the Fenco cell. And these are very um, low-end um, devices that are really for um, home usage or um, you know, the home office or small office because they are only, um, they give a very small amount of capacity and uh, really, there's a few, only a few users that can be on at the same time. So, really, the target is the smaller, the very small venue, so to speak. There was a lot of talk today about Wi-Fi solutions. This is also one of our strategies to help offload our network. Um, there's, you know, advantages for both the customer, the venue owner, as well as the, the cellular carrier to use the Wi-Fi network to help us offload some of the traffic that we have. So there's a lot of business solutions that 
we focus on from carrier to carrier solutions, venue owned DAS. We um, seriously look at getting on um, the DAS systems that, are, that the venue owns. Um, we do have our own specification in, in terms of what we're able to, what DAS systems we're able to connect to. Um, we also will get on a third party managed DAS. Um, you know, if the terms are reasonable for us as the carrier, um, we do host a number of DAS systems. And we are looking at ways to defer CapEx um, through new CapEx uh, deferred strategies so that we can, in fact, be able to deploy more systems. Um, because I think that we all realize that the most challenging um, part about this is that the demand is so great that the capital it just is not there to meet the demands. So we really need to get innovative in the way that we approach the marketplace. Really, in, you know, when you think about that, what's driving us to look at different ways to, to approach this marketplace is the customer demand. And the customer really is the most important asset that we have. So let's talk about some of the um, large-scale deployments, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the key takeaways that we had from this presentation. Um, our largest deployment was, which we feel is probably the largest deployment in the Western Hemisphere, was the Superdome in New Orleans. And there was some talk about this um, today earlier. Um, this has just been a huge project for us. It um, has done some um, major things in offloading our network, especially as it relates to the events that were held at the Superdome. And the performance for us is just a, one of those things that you can really celebrate is that um, the performance was green, green, green. There was more traffic um, on the Superdome, at the Superdome, in uh, some of these events than there was at um, the Super Bowl. The other one I'd like to highlight is the uh, data system that we did, the um, deployment that we did at um, for the um, Indianapolis Super Bowl. Um, it's not just about the stadium. We did do the deployment at the stadium. Um, this was the most, what we consider to be the most connected sporting event ever. Um, but the, the one thing I just want to say about this, and then someone talked earlier about this deployment, but we didn't just focus on the stadium itself. Well, that was very important because we do know how much um, usage there is within the stadium during a particular game, especially that game where people are videotaping, hey, I'm at the game, see me mom, and sending it off to, to their loved ones. Um, the other thing that uh, was really strategic about this is we not only covered the stadium, but we covered the venues around the stadium so that we could provide that, that seamless um, user experience for users when they were at their hotels before and after the game. So some of the key takeaways here is really spectrum, spectrum, spectrum. That is one of the biggest challenges that we face as a carrier, is really having enough spectrum to meet the demands that are out there. And the demand will always continue to be great. It will always continue to grow um, with the new innovations, with, with the, the um, the new generations coming about that that really all they know is wireless. Um.